Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 21st of August 2020. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, the worldwide fight back to save the economy and rebuilding Australia is a full-time job. So firstly today, the worldwide fight back to save the economy. Now we have uh, some really excellent breakthroughs to fill you in on today. But before we get to that, we want to give a quick update on the campaign to defeat bail-in, meaning the ability for banks under crisis powers via the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority to confiscate your deposits and investments to save the failing bank. So, Elisa, people, sh one thing they should know is that this week is actually the third anniversary of us first detecting this law. And it's always a, a, um, a point of humour in this office, the way it came about, because one of our um, staffers here, Doug Mitchell, um, was uh, on a Friday afternoon, uh, happened to be looking at his computer and saw the government's announcement about this law. And it was released on a Friday afternoon in the middle of winter so that no one would pay attention. And Doug just happened to notice in the title something that the language that he recognised as bail-in type language. And he emailed it to me and said, Robbie, is this bail-in? And um, we had a look, showed it to our legal experts and sure it was, right? We're off to the races. And that's now three, three years ago. And since then we've had a massive fight about it. They passed the law on the St Valentine's Day Massacre of Savings in 2018 when there was only eight senators present, not a proper vote, all those things we've reported. But now what we've got is this great opportunity to actually reverse that mm. by clarifying the law so that we make the government put in writing in legislation what they're willing to say verbally but don't want to put in legislation, which is that deposits can't be bailed in. So what we've done through this process of putting this bill into Parliament that Malcolm Roberts um, has introduced is given the government the paintbrush with which to paint itself into a corner, mm. right? And so what, what, where we're at now is on Monday, we're recording this on, on the Friday, on Monday, the 24th of August, the inquiry is due to um, produce its report, release its report, and we'll see what that says. Um, the government is twisting itself into knots to justify trying not to pass this bill, right? but sticks with, it, with its verbal position they won't bail in deposits. So we'll see what that report says. But Malcolm Roberts doesn't have a chance until November to bring this forward to a debate in, and a vote in Parliament. So that'll give us still plenty of time. It doesn't matter what the report says on Monday. We have plenty of time to work really hard on the members of Parliament mm. to demand they support this bill. And so the calls that people make to their local member of Parliament, to the senators, etc., keep doing that. Harass them to death. There's a whole bunch of them that are, that are new in Parliament. They weren't even there when this bill was passed. They've got to know about it. Most politicians are quite ignorant on these things. They're only going to learn about it from getting calls from the public. Now, Malcolm Roberts' bill, of course, has been in this Economics Committee inquiry. And last week, he made a submission on his own bill to that inquiry. Why did he do that? Well, he, he, he had the, the sort of the right to do it a bit late. Um, but he wanted to just... You know, he, he's taken ownership of this process, right? I mean, we're, we're working with him very closely, but it's really good that he is committed to making sure this happens, this, this, that we give this bill the best opportunity to pass. And he took the time to look at all the submissions that were made and he produced his own submission that endorsed all the best parts of the, of the submissions that have been made. Um, and now he's actually actively campaigning for people like we are. He's, he's spreading the word... Um, to, to getting people to share his submission around so that everybody in Parliament knows this is a fight. Remember one of the problems in 2018, I, I was there. When this bill was passed, most of the people in that building were completely ignorant that it was even happening. I mean, that's, that's the week Barnaby Joyce's sex scandal blew up. That's all the media were ca cared about. I had meetings with National Party MPs and they all cancelled because they went to ground worried about the media asking them about that, right? And under, it was under those circumstances they can get this momentous legislation through. So we can't, we, the process we're in now where we're telling you, you call a member of parliament, harass them, that makes sure that can't happen, right? And then they can have their own fights internally when they get together and say to, you know, a lot of liberals will be saying to Scott Morrison, what's wrong with passing this law? We can get these people off our back, right? If we're not going to bail in deposits, pass the law and make it clear. And that's, gonna, that's what we want to happen. Yeah. Now we'll take a quick break before we come back and discuss the big breakthrough I mentioned on national banking. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome back to the Citizens Report. We're discussing the worldwide fight back to save the economy. And so after um, three to four decades of selling off our assets, offshoring, outsourcing, deregulating, deregulating. everything, we find the entire world finds itself in the same boat. We're in a crisis and suddenly we don't have the infrastructure required on any front to deal with it. Uh, and therefore you have countries around the world where various leading factions of all political persuasions are beginning to look at the necessity for infrastructure and of course the question begged by that which is how do we fund it that's the big issue and we talk a lot about that here in Australia and have done as a political party for three decades now in recent weeks we've mentioned uh, a coalition that has sprung up around this project in the United States which is called the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank NIB for short and the real breakthrough that we've seen is that this week's US Democratic Party convention, which of course is where they've announced Joe Biden as the candidate and so forth, had one really good aspect to it. I can't, I don't know of any other good aspects that no, they've had, but, rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> but one really good development, which is, represents an extraordinary breakthrough, and the NIB is mentioned in the Democratic Party coalition, but they hosted at the convention three days of 90-minute uh, webinars on each of those three days uh, sponsored by this NIB coalition. And I want to play you a compilation of clips from five of the speakers. There's many more, and we urge you to go to the link that we put on YouTube or on the screen um, to watch the proceedings because they are excellent. Of course, this coalition includes congressmen, economists, experts in infrastructure and industry, unions, and a whole raft of associations and municipal agencies. Who you'll hear from here are a number of unionists, a former head of Amtrak, and to begin with, up first, is a prominent economist who was with the IMF for many years. So and just to be clear, what they're talking about is a specific bill in the US Congress now for a National Infrastructure Bank Act of 2020 and what it would do, and all these different people adding their different perspective on it. Yep, so we'll roll that clip. So other speakers are going to tell you that we've had four infrastructure banks in our nation's past and how they perform so well to build infrastructure. This iteration around what we've done is to ask ourselves the question, what would it take to build and repair out all of our infrastructure in the United States if we were not constrained by budgets in any way, if we had the full funding to fix and repair and build out everything? So what we did was we went to the American Society of Civil Engineers, who in their 2017 report said, we need $4.6 trillion just to bring infrastructure up to a state of good repair. Every time this bank has been done, there have been naysayers everywhere who have always said, this is a bad idea. It will never work. And at the end of the time, all four banks ended in the black. They made a profit. They weren't designed to make profits. That's not what this bank is about. This bank is not going out and saying we have to have 10% return, we have to have 5% return. This bank is about building infrastructure because once the infrastructure is built, then manufacturing and businesses and, and people can start to take advantage of that. We're putting in the base, the most important, the, the foundation for our economy economy to be able to move forward. And that is why this bank is so important. To Republican President Herbert Hoover initiated the RFC during his last year in office, even though he thought using legislation to combat the Great Depression was like passing a law to stop a hurricane. It's a good thing President Franklin Roosevelt knew better. Under Jones's and FDR's leadership, the RFC became the nation's largest bank and biggest investor. It saved thousands of homes, farms, banks, and businesses. It built aqueducts, tunnels, and bridges throughout the nation. It saved the railroads and even financed the development of high-speed trains. It brought electricity to rural Americans and even sold them appliances on credit so they could plug into the modern age. It helped communities rebuild their towns and cities after natural disasters. And it even helped farmers store their crops until prices rose 
so they could save their land. So every time that we asked for money, Amtrak asked for money, we were not given it. It was always, we couldn't afford to do it. And you're forcing your project managers to reduce the scope of certain projects, which creates an issue. And that's why safety comes into view and other things come into view because the projects never finished. So in those 60 years, the mindset changed from the betterment of the country to how much is it gonna cost and we really could not afford it. After that, going into the 90s and the 2000s, manufacturing, which now was costing a lot of money within this country, became unaffordable by certain companies and people. And manufacturing was moved and outsourced and brought offshore. And this infrastructure bank bill provides, at this point, $650 billion for the construction of these high-speed rail corridors. And uh, not only does it like give jobs to our members, it gives jobs to construction trades and the building trades division. It uh, is good for our economy. It is good for its high paying jobs. And it provides a, a, a clean, uh, environmentally safe uh, transportation system to connect major cities, uh, mega regions like Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, so this kind of investment can only really be done with, uh, with the help of the federal government and the infrastructure bank provides a very fundamental structure in which to, the states can apply for loans and help uh, complete construction of these projects. And one of the things that the second speaker there, Bob Lynn, emph also emphasised is that... He's a union guy. Yeah, is that you have such a piecemeal approach currently to infrastructure in the United States where various entities have to compete for the limited funds that are available and so you end up, you know, rather than having a top-down coordinated approach, you might be digging up the same road five times to put down electricity wires or pipelines, you know, rather than having it done all in the one go and looking at the entire nation and what is needed to transform it. Um, so there's really just begging for a shift here. And what we're seeing is in many other countries, the same shift in South Africa, for instance, the ruling African Nations Congress has drafted a plan for a fully capitalised state-owned bank, which would also be able to take in, um, pension funds and invest them in the construction of long-term infrastructure and reindustrializing the country. And another report we just received was from Scotland, where the Institute of Civil Engineers called for the Scottish National Investment Bank, which was launched in 2018, to focus on infrastructure to, quote, quickly stimulate economic activity and capitalise on the longer term opportunities. Bold government investment should be set out in the forthcoming infrastructure investment plan. Now, here in Australia, uh, Robbie, we've had a lot of discussion about this idea, even coming from within the unions here. Well, it's ta look, we, and it needs to be. There's all these concrete developments around the world. We need the same here. So we do know that Bob Catter is Member of Parliament for Queensland, is, is planning to introduce a bill for a national development bank in Australia. Um, there is support for this idea across the minor parties, including, you know, from the Greens to One Nation. Um, there's support inside, there's, there's expressed support for an in, from individuals in the coalition government, funnily enough, um, the Labor Party has been pretty quiet up until, until now, but um, we've now got the, the think tank called Per Capita, which is a, a left-wing think tank, produced a discussion paper for the CEPU, the, the Communication Electrical Plumbing Union, on a post office national savings and loan bank, which would be very complementary to what we're talking about with the National Development Bank. In fact, the two effectively should, should and could be um, merged together so it, so it functions the same. Um, and this will, be, this will put Labor on the spot. As we've said in the press release that we're putting out today, Labor and the unions must support a national bank because they're the ones that gave us... Australia has a great history with the Commonwealth Bank, right? We, Australia would not be the Australia it is today if it wasn't for the Commonwealth Bank and we wouldn't have had the Commonwealth Bank if it wasn't for the Labor Party and the unions who mm -hmm. made this their number one goal when they first formed the party back in the, at the um, end of the last... The, the, in the 1890s. So... What's Labor going to do? See, pro problem is Hawke and Keating sold them out on this question. They went, they, they sided with the bankers, and now the results are in. It's been a disaster. We're we're going off a cliff economically, and I don't, 
I just want to make a, an example, Elisa. There's lots of coffee shop type businesses that are being smashed by these lockdowns. And I feel for every single one of them. Mm. But there's too many of them. That's all we do in this country, right? Where the, whereas the young people who are starting these kind of businesses, they should be aspiring to, to, to participate in an economy that's far more productive, where they could be not just concentrating in Sydney and Melbourne, helping develop all of Australia. And you can do that, sort of have that kind of perspective with a national development bank, right? Create And you create jobs directly by building infrastructure and in industries. You create lots more jobs indirectly by making sure you supply those projects yourself from your own business, from your own industry, steel, cement making, machine making, etc. right? We can put this economy back to work properly and all these things are possible. If we don't go this way, we are heading off a cliff. And I, I, I'm seeing no signs from Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg mm. that they have any intention of actually doing something proactively to, to stop that from happening. And instead they're saying things like, oh, it's going to take five years for high unemployment to come down. That's national suicide, right? This is what changes it. And, it, and, and it's a, the issue facing us is facing the whole world, yep. but we can win this. Yep, this is the real moment that we have the leverage to do it now. And we also want to draw people's attention to a, another video that we've put out on this subject of national banking because we could talk about this for the whole show. Um, so we'll put up on the screen uh, an image and link to a new show that we've just issued under the Citizens Insight series. So this is an interview that Glenn Isherwood from Citizens Party conducted with Sam Hansen. Uh, and Sam, uh, do you want to say a bit about... Well, this? Sam's done an excellent documentary called The Battle for the Bank. It's, quite, it's actually quite long. So I, I suggest people watch this interview, which is the shorter version of it, where Sam explains the concepts and then um, watch the longer, the longer documentary. But it gives a history and it, it, it'll give you the, the labour history in this that I just touched on as well, right? So it's a really, really important interview and it shows you the, mm. hi the important history that you can look at that and go, well, we can do that again. And that's something you can circulate, including to your MPs as well. Um, now, also, there's more on national banking and the breakthroughs in the latest Australian Alert, so call us if you haven't. We'll send you a complimentary copy. We'll be right back after this break to discuss why rebuilding Australia is a full-time job. We need everyone involved. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. We're now discussing rebuilding Australia is a full-time job. Enough of this part-time labour casualisation. This phenomenon has left our economy in the lurch and it's really becoming obvious uh, amidst this pandemic. Now, I want to show some graphs and some figures of the shift that we've seen over recent decades. I mean, first of all, the OECD places Australia as the third worst, worst country in the world for casualisation of labour. Um, there's figures showing uh, on this graph from the 1960s through till today, um, the increasing ratio of people that are only part-time employed. There's figures to show, of course, that this most greatly affects the youth. So of course we're seeing a big problem with our young people today only being able to access part-time or casual jobs and having to have two or three of them to keep going and you referenced that before we need to change that in order to get people into really um, inspiring jobs of building the nation. And then finally um, one of the things you also notice from the figures is the high proportion of these casual and part-time jobs occurring in the service industry where we see the, the lowest rates of that casualisation are in the productive sector and things like um, manufacturing and industry. Those, those productive jobs are still mainly full-time jobs. Yeah. And one of the areas, of course, where we saw the problems arising with casualisation of labour, of course, down here in Victoria has been uh, with aged care and uh, so many people having to take shifts at different nursing homes to make ends meet. And at St Basil's here in Faulkner, just next suburb, next door here where we are, um, had uh, one, the first worker that was infected had worked a number of shifts in the few, first few days of her infected period. So normally you wouldn't consider the entire workforce of that aged care centre to be a close contact of her. However, because she worked so many shifts, everyone had to be put down and put into quarantine and this has become a big problem in many centres where 
replacing an entire workforce with other staff is almost impossible to do and hence the problems we've seen. The, the, the other example of this, Elisa, is in the security quarantine fiascos. We want to play a couple of clips. Just to, it's not, this, is, this is from the news, this is from 60 Minutes about the Melbourne stuff up, but it also there's a new case in Sydney where a security guard there that was involved in hotel quarantine um, has has is, is there's, there's concern he's he's he may have played a role in spreading the virus up there. But the the main point we want to play these clips is just look at the the, the extreme casualisation of these workforces in these two clips. So the first one is 60 minutes. In the hotel quarantine operation, the subcontracting worked like this. The companies awarded the government contract, we're told, were paid up to $70 an hour per guard. But because they didn't have the numbers they needed, they subcontracted to smaller firms offering about $50 an hour and taking a big cut. But some of those smaller firms subcontracted again for even less, taking their slice too. And this second clip is from Channel 10's report on the, the Sydney security guard. Just look how many jobs this guy has to work, right? And of course, once they found out he's a problem, you know, you, you just see, you wonder when he's working so many jobs, why does he have to? Because that's the nature of the economy. Just have a look. The security guard is a private contractor. What is now clear is that he may have exposed thousands of people through his other work. After working at the hotel on the 3rd, 4th, 7th and 8th, he took a shift at the Sydney Markets in Flemington the following day between 8am and 4pm. He then worked at Parramatta Local Court on August 11 between 8.30am and 12.30pm. Going back to Flemington that night for a shift from 10.30pm to 6am the next day. Within two hours, he was back at Parramatta Court for another shift and returned to the markets again that night, working between 10.30pm to 1.40 in the morning. So these clips, I mean, they, they, you know, they illustrate the problem. It's not like you'd never have uh, casual work and casual jobs in a workforce, but this is the overwhelming nature of our economy nowadays. That's the, why it's a problem. And if we actually started changing the, the nature of the economy, creating full-time productive jobs again, right, we can move away, start solving this problem, and, and rebuilding Australia is going to be a full-time job. The successful economies that, that emphasise building infrastructure show that. Mm. And just by way of contrast how you can change the way the economy looks, I wanted to raise China as an example because they've, of course, built so much high-speed rail in the recent period and they're planning to double their high-speed rail again from 35,000 kilometres to 70,000 kilometres by 2035, so in the next 15 years. And on the 21st of June, they just tested one of their 600 kilometre an hour test tracks for maglev rail, which planes travel about 800 kilometres an hour, that's the commercial jets. So this is f fantastic and they're going to be building nine new maglev lines, 1,000 kilometres worth. So this is the kind of thing Australia should be thinking about. They even built 207 billion worth of transport infrastructure in the first six months of this year, even with the pandemic going on. And, and it's why, Elisa, our exports to China keep going up. The, the iron ore trade from Western Australia has not suffered at all. It's just got stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, like I say, it's probably not good that Australia is so dependent on one economy that we, as we are on China, but we're very lucky it's China we're dependent on because they do real things. That's why they're a success. If America went with the National Infrastructure Bank idea that we showed earlier, right, and got their economy going the same way, they would fear China less and the world would be a safer place as well. Yeah, we should all be utilising those methods to put people first at this critical time. So that's all we've got time for today. Tune in next week for more. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Eliza. See you next week. Thank you.